what I want to discuss today is life at the Maya courts, the Maya society, what we learn about Maya society from my hieroglyphs, reading Maya texts. Uh, from those at the very top, obviously you've seen that slide before, the lords, those who shout, the public speakers, uh, or the rulers, ahatak in plural. Uh, the, the important point is that there are essentially three parts to what it means to be king. First, of course, you are a sacred king, right? You are a hautak because you speak to the gods and ancestors. That's your primary job, technically. But then, of course, you're a politician. You have alliances, you wage wars, you take risks dealing with other lords. And then, of course, as a lord, you're a member of social class. So you protect your social class from the commoners who perhaps also want to be lords or who want to question the meaning of what it means to be lords. In fact, when the classic Maya civilization collapsed in the 10th century AD, this class disappeared. The Spaniards arrived and there was no large group of lords anymore. But the term was still there. And in fact, some colonial documents applied to the Spanish ruler, suggesting that the idea of the, those supreme kings was still out there. It was just not mainstream anymore. So nobody wanted to claim lordship and keep it. Uh, kings exceeded as gods. We've seen that. Uh, there's the king of Palenque exceeding as one of the patrons of, of the dynasty, G1. We've seen that, the sacred king, he's the source of divine energy, basically, in the same way as the celestial alligator is the source of rain as divine energy. So kings are surrounded by gods and they do these things for the gods and the ancestors. They're also politicians, they go to war. Uh, those kings of Yashchalan, each monument they have shows them as sacred kings on one side and as successful warriors on the other side of every monument, every stela. But that also means you can get captured. This is the king of Palenque as a captive by uh, his rival from the town of Tonina, the ancient kingdom of Popo. And there he is still carrying his royal crown. They really wanted to, to emphasize that that was no ordinary captive. That was a king. In fact, we know he came back to Palenque and ruled as a vessel until he was perhaps assassinated by his own court members. Because nobody wants to have a powerless king as their leader, the one who lost his Chabil and Akbal, who can no longer talk to the gods properly because he went through this experience of being captured, of being humiliated. So his nephew took over. Some kings are not that lucky. This is the king of the side of Naranko, Yashmayu Chanchak. That's the end of his political career with the help of the king of Tikal. He's already bundled and he's about to be put on an altar. That's how many Maya kings ended up. Lifespans in smaller kingdoms were about twice as short compared to lifespans at bigger kingdoms. Because if you're a small kingdom, there's a greater chance that one of your neighbors decides to build some political and social capital by basically conquering you and, and taking you to the altar. This is the text from uh, Copan. There it was an internal conflict between basically distant relatives of the same royal family, two capitals, one capital of the kingdom against the other capital of the kingdom. They actually destroyed, burned the gods. They, they described how they drilled fire into some kind of effigy of the four lords and then the four patron gods of Copan the gods of Kawil, and then they beheaded Kawil, the ruler of Kopan himself. Uh, they captured him and they beheaded him. So that's, that's also possible with your king. So those responsibilities and high status, they come with risks. And my kings were aware of that. Queens, of course, uh, were equally important. The title for Maya queens is goddess. Remember, they're not holy lords. They are goddesses, female deities. Ishik. Uh, these are queens of the family of Kanul, sort of the imperial royal dynasty of the Maya. 
that's how they traveled in their personal vehicles uh well, carried by an ample amount of servants i imagine uh and each queen had uh, a patron deity protecting her this is an early classic queen arriving from the side of Tsibanche at the side of La Corona. And she is dressed as a priestess carrying a staff and a huge Teotihuacan deity is behind her. Uh, and this is a later queen from the same royal family arriving at the same place of La Corona uh, in a slightly different uh, palanquin. Those, those are palanquins? So these are large, enormous houses moved by presumably many many servants and king, queens traveled in those and they were at the same time statues of their patron gods so they would never apart the queens and their gods if you marry one of these queens you are effectively a vessel most of the time these queens were like representatives like emissaries of their brothers and other relatives from the Kanul royal family so Kanul royal family essentially politicized marriage they transformed marriage into an institution of imperial control. You accept one of these queens, and there she arrives with this palanquin, with the retinue, builds a palace, and governs from that palace. Uh, uh, queens, of course, are sacred queens. We've seen that image. Very important rituals are also undertaken by my queens, but my queens are also warrior queens. This is a Kanul queen from the side of El Peru. She actually carries a shield and a lightning got a wheel, like a bolt of lightning in her hand. Yes, her husband also got a stila. Uh, he's, he's shown like next to her, uh, but they are depicted as equals. Her incredibly lavish burial was, was excavated by the Elpira archeological project. Uh, so uh, this is the queen of Naranjo. And she emphasized that she came from the dynasty of Tikal kings and great overlords. And she often is depicted standing on captives. Yes, she is the moon goddess. It's not like she cross dresses as male or switches her gender roles. She's perfectly comfortable in her in her gender roles, but also standing on captives. And she does her sacred uh, queenly rituals, but the glyphs inside say eternal warfare. Bolon min and. So uh, these are basically fearsome military leaders. Um, so it was both for men and women to assume roles in the sacred life of the kingdom, but also to assume military leadership when necessary. There were a lot, uh, there were a lot of lords. That's very important. The more we are into the late classic period, the more lords we actually see in the inscriptions. Uh, more references to groups, to coll collectives of lords, Ahautak, in plural. There are many, many, many royal dynasties, right? Those are acknowledged royal dynasties among the classic Maya. You kind of wonder, how could a political machine with so many moving parts ever function? But the point is that those dynasties were not all equal, that they were part of a very complex system of alliances and conflicts so it's like being part of a web when you know exactly where you are as a node who is your ally who is your superior who is your mortal enemy and so each royal family essentially kept track of these relationships and could position itself more or less consistently within a particular node of the political system <laughs> yes and the designer of this chart uh Simon Martin is British and, and, and he's a graphic designer. And, and this was obviously uh, inspired by the London uh, subway system or so most people think. So this is an example, uh, someone who is a member of the local royal family of holy Chatan people or divine Chatan people. He in fact is the left hand of someone else who happens to be a vassal of a uh, supreme ruler Kalomte of Ushtetun, a toponym associated with part of the ancient Maya side of Kalakmul. So, so a three-level hierarchy here, and that's just among the kings, I'm not talking about people further down in, in the political system. Um, so if you were a member of the royal family, any royal family, it was like being a member of a corporate group. So it's not like 
a direct patrilineal descent system. In fact, most of the European royal houses don't work that way too. There's usually a designated heir, but there's a huge pool of distant and not so distant relatives who can all potentially claim the throne if they ever get a chance. And they may occupy different roles within the royal house, performing different duties for the royal family. So in the same way, uh, the king named Knich Lamal Ik of the Ikar royal family, he wasn't actually the son of the king, although his father was from the royalty. At first, he occupied the position of Baat's Am, literally the principal throne, so sort of like key civilian administrator. Then, after almost 10 years of serving in that position, he was promoted to a holy Ahau, holy ka lord. And then, after 10 years of serving that, he became the high king, Kalomte, presumably replacing the previous Kalomte, Yahate Knich, in that position. And that seems to be how the system worked. So there would be a, a, a diaspora of more or less close relatives each occupying a specific position in the hierarchy. So you could have several lords in charge, for example, of several cities of the kingdom. Uh, and then there'll be a high king of the same family above them all. So in this case, uh, this is a high king of Piedras Negras, and he has vassals from three different kingdoms. But one of these kingdoms is actually represented by four rulers, all with the same title of Tkalach Lord. And those Tkalach Lord, we know, that they are based at at least four different locations, all more or less in the same area of the Lakanha Swamp. These are islands on the swamp and streams and little pools. Uh, those are not big sites by, by, by all means, but they're distinct locations of power. And between them, they sometimes decide who is the high king and who is not the high king. And occasionally uh, they fight over that, as you can imagine, or make marriage alliances between them. Uh, and and uh, that's pretty much the life of most royal families from the very tiny ones, like these fellas from the present day uh, nature conservation area around Lake, uh, like on, uh, around River La Cantun and La Cantun Selva of Mexico, uh, to some great kings like Canol family based at Zibanche and Calagmul. They all function the same way, it's just the scale that is slightly different. Say, this is the royal palace of Calagmul at the peak of its imperial powers. They have this enormous compound where you can keep all the extended royal family, all the hostages, all the visitors from other places, all the goodies. Uh, there's a huge uh, central market, which is completely walled for the customs, probably, uh, and, and secondary palaces. So all of that is kind of the beating heart of a large hegemonic state. Uh, this is a, a polity with some regional ambitions, but it, the palaces are much smaller because they're serving a smaller set of constituents, or uh, a comparable uh, palace from uh, Motul de San Jose, also some regional ambitions, several vassal families, but a much smaller social circle, place where I work, Homu, an even smaller uh, set of palaces, uh, actually uh, not contemporaneous. Uh, these are sequential uh, affairs built by uh, different generations of the same royal family. So once again, operating a much smaller circle of dependents and visitors. Uh, we use the term the royal court, and the implication is that the body of the king is central, the extended household of the king is at the very heart of the political system, everybody is sort of around it in one way or another, the proximity to the royal body is what, what matters, and uh, every step below the family of the king, there are similar courts, uh, people have their own houses and manage their affairs exactly like the king does just at a smaller scale. So there's a royal house and the royal house affairs. And then there's a house of provincial governor and the house of the provincial governor may look exactly like the royal house. In fact, some of these provincial gov governors may aspire to be kings one day, right? And they try to play the big game and occasionally win. Yeah. So these like smaller like figures, they, they have their own like courts. Their exactly. And, 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 and of course, they cannot call themselves kings, but occasionally they might. And occasionally they may, may even get away with that. And occasionally they may not. And uh, they may marry into royalty. And we see the, you know examples of that. So this is, of course, our king of Homo. Uh, and and in, in afterlife, he is surrounded by lords and commoners. And it's very important. The term for commoners is literally backcountry people. 
So the assumption is if you're close to the king, to the sun, right? You're amongst the lords. The further you are from the king, the more commoner you are, the more back country you are. So there is this notion of centrality, which is about the body of the ruler, who is the key intersector between the gods, ancestors, and living humans. And the idea is that for every royal court, you know, there is tiny, tiny courts, and sometimes they're not so tiny. This is the royal court of a 16th king of Copan. And this is the residence of one of his subordinates in the same city. They're the same size. Some of these rich and successful families, this is not someone of royal blood. He's just Nakhun, a priest and administrator of the court in charge of uh, a small trade enclave of traders from central Honduras. You can see it's very packed. Uh, so that's presumably a source of wealth and influence. Uh, and, and, and that means that the palace of that official is on par and in fact built with the same artisans, with the help of the same artisans and resources as the royal palace, just only slightly smaller. So if we look at a royal court, a typical scene of a royal family, which one group we see is the royals themselves, right? The Kukulahau is in the center, uh, visiting Kukulahau, all of the divine kings, uh, lords, uh, youths, uh, children. Then we see people who are not royalty, but who potentially can pass their rank to the next generation, to their children. So we can call them nobles. In this particular scene, the Sahals, uh, the banded bird officials, and the Hunts are those. We see the children and, and spouses and daughters of these individuals, they carry the same title, suggesting this is something that is inherited and therefore close to our concept of nobility. Now, the, the Maya term for nobles at the time of the Spanish conquest in Yucatec Mayan is Almehen, literally son of mother, son of father. So the idea is that if you trace your parents, if you know your parents, that's what basically makes people noble. They have genealogies, they have ancestry. And this is uh, a couple of examples of vassals which belong to young people. And they uh, are described as son of mother, son of father, Yal Yunen. Yal, son of mother, Yunen, son of father, or Yal Mihin. Mihin, Yunen are synonyms, basically, for son of father. It seems that the same concept is there, right? In the, 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 that if you are basically who your parents are, and that's what makes you noble, and these individuals are young, we not have we home, so 20, a priest in, in his first 20 years of life. So we're talking about young people. And this individual is also we not have home, so a priest in his first uh, 20 year of life. Um, it's very hard to become royalty or to become nobles. You cannot be promoted into kingship. The only way is through marriage. And of course, you may not become a king through marriage, but your children will have a bit of royalty in them, right? It's kind of social uh, promotion. Uh, but everyone can potentially be appointed to a courtly position, potentially giving them access to more stable hereditary jobs and offices at the court. So that seems to be how the system worked for most people. If you're a successful farmer and you start trading, you make things, you may hope one day to get a royal appointment, say become a tax collector if you're a good trader. And then uh, one day you may be given a military captaincy you may excel in other positions, get a higher level court appointment, and then ultimately perhaps marry into the royal family so that your kids would have a shot at, at the big game for royalty, right? For high offices. Uh, and and your, your family ultimately as a corporate group would benefit from that. So this is a good story. This is a Lacombe official. He says he's the father of the king. So he made it. I mean, his son, of course, made it. He himself is just a lakam, just a tax collector. This person, a Sahal, a provincial governor from, from the side of Lakamha, his son made it. His son married a princess. 
But there are also limits to how far you can push this notion of social mobility. When his son married a second princess from a different city, that's when the civil war started. Because his son was not royalty. So presumably there are some boundaries you cannot cross through these marriage arrangements. So your blood cannot become royal, basically. That's what Maya believed. Royal blood can be mixed with non-royal blood so that there is royal blood in the children. But adults cannot become kings. They cannot declare themselves kings. And that seems to be a very important concept. And it allows uh, the royals pretty much to sustain their regimes by promising royalty to people who are potentially a threat, who become powerful, who become influential, who become successful perhaps economically, so that the balance of the politics and the economy is maintained. The other important part that you need to remember when we talked about what Mayas think about themselves, uh, one important concept here, I, I haven't used it before, is individuals. So we are individuals. Our concept of self implies a unity of selves. Like me is just one entity. What I want and I desire can be described with a, with a pronoun me, my. It's not true for Mesoamerica. This is a scene of someone's death from a codex law. It's, it's, a, it's a Mishnah codex. What you see is different souls each having its own way so when your body dies like an explosion all of these things are packed inside you each has its own volition the same thing happens with a maya person dying all of all of his souls are having their separate ways the idea is with individuals motifs and volition don't matter because you think of yourself as a collection of entities which blend into other peoples and social groups. So, say, our notion of justice is so heavily based on motif, on, like, intent. Like, whether you killed someone willingly or unwillingly is important. Whether you did something legal, willingly and, or unwillingly, that matters in our justice system. For individuals, it doesn't matter at all. Because the notion of volition is unclear. If you have five different animistic entities and each wants its own thing, then whatever you do ultimately at a particular moment in time doesn't matter in terms of what you wanted to do. But what really matters is that you actually did it. In a society that doesn't discuss intent, is not interested in intent, but is centered on what actually happens, there's much more emphasis on visibility. Trust is not built because we believe that other people are good people. We don't know because they're not people. They're just entities, many entities. We're more concerned with how and what they do. And as long as they do what we want them to do, we have trust in them. As long as we stop seeing what other people do, we can no longer trust them. So the society really privileges constant interpersonal interaction uh, that's why large events are so important because people can see each other recognize each other and rebuild trust the moment you stop seeing the other people stop knowing what happens you cannot maintain uh, interactions with them that affects uh, politics that affects commerce that affects every aspect of social life even today in my communities this interpersonal interactions are much more important than say here in Tuscaloosa, because trust is everything, and trust is not based on assumption that people are just good people. Because people are individuals, they're not individuals. That's why when we look at top Maya court administrations, the amount of top level officials is always the same, about five or six people, regardless of the scale of the kingdom. And those are usually appointed by the king when he becomes king. Like once you assume a high office, there are probably about five or six people you know really well, you can trust, like your buddies. And probably there's just, there's just more people you can really, really trust. Think about yourself, like how many people you can actually trust besides your parents or you know, brothers and sisters whom you know well enough to give them an important job, to represent you, to wage war in your name, do things like that. And so it seems that 
But the Maya it seems to be about five or six. Those would be holding top positions uh, in, in, in a particular court of a particular king. And the next king would appoint his own people. Uh, so these are various courtly office holders in the scene of that uh, Piotr Snegra's court. You have one Anab, Sahal, principal Sahal, royal speaker, another Sahal, one bandit bird, one Akhon official. So these are some of the top office holders. Now, in a civilian administration, as far as we know, the king carries the white headband and he's the water serpent. That's his identity. Uh, uh, the speaker of the king, the representative of the king is called the mouth of the white headband. And then head throne and head lord are the positions of high administration. Those may be held by members of the royal family, but also by the non-royals. It varies. And then below that, you have Sahal and Akhun provincial governors and priests and Lakam tax collectors. In the large administration, you may have Ba Sahal, like principal Sahal, like sort of head governor, the person in charge of provincial affairs. But those things would depend on the orientation of a particular kingdom. If it's like an expansive military kingdom, you would have a lot of Sahals and some Ba Sahals in charge of basically provincial operations. If you have a kingdom more centered on, say, commerce, and managing of an urban center, then perhaps you will have more Lakams and Akhuns at the court. In the military hierarchy, the king is the sun god and he has the fiery headband. So his representative, so the top position, in addition to the king at times of war would be the mouth of the fiery headband, Tik Akhun. And then you have Yahauk Ak, literally the vassal of fire, and Yahaute, the vassal of the spear. And then Hat spear, hat shield, hat flint, those would be military captains. And presumably below them, all of that huge mass of jobless young men who have nothing else to do and form the bulk of the military. So all these head titles, they're basically jobs in the administration. Uh, and we know that quite well. A lot of my images about supporting the king, like the king is the celestial creature in the sky. But then he is supported by the gods who support the sky. Uh, this is the throne of Palenque. We see the king, we see the gods, but the gods are actual people. They're little captions. They're on the sides of the supports of the thrones. So you cannot see them if you face the king. But of course, if you know these people, and if you know the circumstances of the creation of those supports, you know that these are actual members of the court. They support the king. The moment they decide to walk away, this thing will fall, the sky will fall, the king will fall. Very powerful metaphor here, right? In terms of what really supports power of the king. These individuals like Ahuns, Sahals, principal Sahals, vassals of fire, had you hair appearing to the throne, Tisakun, the speaker of the crown, the mouth of the crown. Those would be high positions you would see in most courtly scenes uh, in, 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 in my attacks and in my imagery. It's interesting that the references to nobles of different kind, they kind of peak in the 8th century. And especially in the western part of Maya uh, area, those are younger kingdoms. The landscape is more fragmented. You have the highlands of Chiapas, mountains, mountain valleys, lots of rivers. So kingdoms are smaller, uh, kingdoms are more warlike. And perhaps uh, provincial rulers have more power. They're kingmakers. They're like uh, barons. Uh, they are magnates, traders. And so they have more prominence. They have their own palaces and monuments. So they have greater visibility. Some of the larger kingdoms, uh, they don't show us uh, nobles. At Copan, it's only after the civil war, after they lose half of the kingdom, then we begin to see nobles in their palaces, perhaps as a sign of weakness or a new kind of deal, right? A new kind of social compact between the royal family and people supporting it. Uh, so there's some ideas, greater populations, instability, smaller polities, landscape, I mentioned all that. So what do, what do these nobles do? Uh, one of my favorite sets, this is Motul de San Jose. They like making beautiful polychrome vases showing scenes of the royal court. Sometimes there are no ownership statements on these vessels. They're really meant to be like given away as like postcards, like 
daily life in the court. Like, welcome to Motul de San Jose. Uh, so we have these scenes, uh, well, of what happens, right? Occasionally, there's a stealer and there's an altar. There's some beheaded volunteer uh, uh, sustaining the universe. Uh, there's a king, of course, but then faithful members of the court uh, in Halloween costumes uh, uh, dutifully assisting the king as, as some kind of nightmarish uh, possums or jaguars. Uh, so that, of course, has to happen. Nobles are there. Uh, a bowl game, the kings play the bowl game, members of the court also play the bowl game, it's very important. Uh, so here you have a king uh, playing with another king and then two members of his court as well. Taxation, uh, so here you have district officials, Lakams, presenting tribute to the king and the queen. It's interesting, the queen is the owner of the vessel, so it's about her, not about king. So apparently the queen is in charge of taxation issues. Uh, so it seems, uh, and in this case, uh, the king from the same family, just a few generations later, is receiving, uh, presumably an interest on a loan and a tribute given to Sahal so that Sahal could repay the interest. And, and that's what we see the presentation of that payment to the king. So, uh, economic transaction drinking, although nobody is really drinking, they all look very tense. And I suspect it's actually about taxes. Because uh, the colonial period tax mentioned that drinking would always be the end of the transactions involving taxation. And they have a whole uh, bowl filled with tallies, perhaps tax records. Uh, uh, and that explains rather tense uh, body language of everyone in the scene. Uh, and dancing. Uh, the king himself is uh, not into dancing, as you can see from, from uh, his body. Uh, he prefers uh, watching. But they have members of the court dancing uh, in these elaborate winged costumes. Uh, and of course, warfare. Uh, so warfare is a big deal. If you're a member of the Maya court, you will have almost certainly military appointments, regardless of how your career progresses from time to time. So military is, is a major vehicle for social mobility. It's also a big source of danger uh, for, for any member of, of the court. The smaller the court, more danger but perhaps more opportunities as well. Uh, so these are just some of the basic types of people you're going to encounter in any Maya court. And I'm going to say just a few words about each of them. So the bulk of the Maya court at any point in time are jobless young men and women. So people looking for an opportunity because all of these noble families, they have lots of kids, lots of families, lots of kids. Those kids have better chance of surviving through childhood because they have better nutrition, sports, healthy living, but then no jobs. So uh, they have to distinguish themselves, most likely through warfare. And in this way, they reduce the overpopulation of nobles by you know, killing each other. Um, and that's how the system works. So jobless or, or young, or actually the term means immature or unripe so and you can be immature of course at any stage in your life uh, and uh, so this is chok and it's interesting that of course babies are babies old people old people adults are adults there's no logram for adult except for the sign person 20 but chok it actually shows you the war mask of the storm god so the main implication seems to be that well, that's what the military is made of, the bulk of any fighting force in any Maya kingdom. Um, so uh, chok, young, unripe, plural is chok tak. Uh, syllable cho, syllable ko, or that logogram of the storm god face. And you can use chok as an adjective, like a young ruler of so-and-so, like young bakab, young lord of Yokib, young lord of Pachan, young lord of Mutal. Uh, uh, but that also implies that you're not a lord of Motel, right? You're just aspiring to be one, one day, perhaps. Uh, you can also be principal child. So this person is principal mother's child, mommy's boy. Uh, it's an official title, apparently. Uh, I guess not of his dad. Dad perhaps had another favorite, but that was, he was his mother's favorite. Uh, uh, there are other titles like Chakchok, literally mighty, red, youth. 
uh, in the sense of, I guess, power like the sun, like fear, fierceness. Uh, uh, the other terms are shib, like male, but also someone who's scary. Uh, and kelem, also male youth. So chak, chak, ok, kelem, or a chak, shib, ok would be a common combination of describing this kind of fierce, militarized, uh, masculine youth. Uh, these people are those of chak, shib, of scary or mighty men uh, these are actually gladiators going after each other with sharpened bones um, you can be principal youth usually that means you are expecting to get a job right you're next to your desired position usually kingship so baj ok means you're king to be a king in waiting and higher than your other brothers and more distant siblings Deities can be young too. Uh, I guess for them it's permanent. So young uh, G1. Uh, this is, these are references to young dead god and young celestial king of gods. So I guess they were young too one day, right? Uh, they're part of the same cycle of life as we all are. Uh, this is young demon, young uh, omen jaguar. So it seems to be. There's a young bunny. And uh, this is the moon goddess, uh, and she is the omen of the young. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. So these are young people as warriors, uh, militant variety of the rain god attacking the wind god and taking all the tribute. So these are some of the divine prototypes of what the young people are supposed to do. Uh, some gods are uh, young, uh, like guardians, perhaps because they're war gods or perhaps because they're creator gods, like the four quadrants of the world, or perhaps both. Uh, but Chok is a situational title. You can die of old age and remain a young person because you have never matured. So that, mean, that can mean that you never had kids, you never had family, but also you never acquired an expected status in life. And that applies to both men and women. So you can have people who are married, who have kids, and are still Chok. You can have men who are married and kids are still chok, and you can have women who are married and have kids but are still chok, because the assumption is they aspire to something greater. There is a career ahead of them that they haven't fulfilled yet. And so uh, these are women. This is a queen, and, and, and kind of clarifies this point. She's called a chok here because she never had a chance to be like supreme queen mother. She was the spouse of a prince. Uh, the prince died in his 50s. Uh, he never lived to see his son becoming king because they're all these you know, older brothers. So the idea is presumably that she never fulfilled her top career roles in life. So she died unripe, immature, not because she was young, but because there could have been more. So. And it's interesting that those career aspirations, they're, they're presented for both men and women. It's not just about age, not just about kids, not just about family. It's this notion that there are these greater roles to which we all aspire and which fulfill us. Uh, in this case, of course, high political offices. And of course, young people require supervision. You've seen that. The guardians of the youth is one of my favorite fellow who's smoking a cigarette, presumably taking a break from all those child caring, you know, duties. Uh, this is another uh, supervisor while his uh, supervisee is doing his first bloodletting. Young people own a lot of things, especially a lot of pottery is owned by young people. The assumption is they are the ones who travel most, right? They're the ones who are engaged in feasts and in gift giving. And there is also an assumption that a lot of the vessels we see, they're actually giving as part of coming of age rituals. So these are like birthday presents when you reach adulthood. Uh, and some of these vessels have no names suggesting they're supposed to pass on uh, from one adult to his kids and so on. Uh, so owned by, 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 by young people. And they show things which matter, right? Bowl game, service, war, uh, things to which young uh, men and women have to aspire to, right? There are other possessions, of course, like this 
This mace is obviously owned by a young warrior, perhaps not entirely ceremonial, uh, useful uh, stone mace. Uh, this is the back of a mirror owned by a young person too. Um, young people were supposed to live and meet in certain houses for young men. Those are described in colonial sources. Those were places where people would bond in different ways, drink, uh, have uh, sexual relationships of all kinds, uh, uh, have a great time together. And that was before they become adults and, you know, get married and, and, and start performing specific roles. But those were presumably important too, because they would allow them to transition to adulthood, to do things that otherwise they would never be able to do in the family, uh, with their parent, uh, you know, in the presence of their parents and also to bond presumably as a military unit, right? So that they could then uh, act cohesively in, in warfare. So we have scenes from one of these possible uh, uh, youth houses uh, uh, from Rancho San Diego. And, and it seems to be consistent what colonial sources describe uh, of, of these youth houses. Spanish priests did not approve uh, things were happening in the youth houses. Like uh, exactly, that's pretty much the idea, right? So and these, are, these are kinds of relationships of brotherhoods, which would, you know, stay for life. And presumably, uh, there were also similar houses for young ladies doing other things. Uh, so uh, different things that young people can do. Uh, visiting uh, other courts was important. Of course, not all of those visits were voluntary. A lot of young people were sent for apprenticeship to the courts of the overlords. And those apprentices were also part-time hostages, right? In case things go south, they would, those would be the first to to be to be tortured. Uh, uh, but but ultimately, that would also be a source of training and knowledge. And the fact that people across Maya Lowland shared same writing system, same set of ideas, even you know similar handwriting styles. Those were, of course, because a lot of young people say traveled to the great city of Tsibanchi and then to the great city of Kalakmul to learn the arts to learn the ways of the nobility. Uh, so young people were the main uh, vehicle, the main sort of conduit of information for the classic Maya society. They would play ball, uh, they would party, uh, they would help the adults in doing various jobs, right? In this case, the provincial governor is, is paying an interest on a loan with a tribute he collected from another subordinate lord and members of his household's chok are helping carrying the tribute, but they also see in their presence at the event, they listen what top people are discussing. So they're learning essentially on the job, right? So this notion of apprenticeship is very important in the classic Maya world. And of course, you learn to play music. A Maya, an educated Maya person was supposed to play musical instruments, flutes, trumpets, drums, and those things you presumably learn in places like the youth house, as well, uh, some youths were apparently uh, learning real jobs because, you know, there are only this many kings and there are always more royals. And so some young men presumably chose a career of craftsmanship and, and carving because, well, it's, it's a real job and it pays the bills. So we do have princes who become carvers, uh, who become professional artisans and, and artists. Um, now. If you grow up, right, uh, kingship, of course, was one option for the use of the royal rank of the royal birth. And then everybody else would assume other jobs in life. So one option for non-royals was to become a Sahal, a provincial governor, a military commander. Uh, there are different translations of the term. Uh, uh, the important part is many Sahal governors, even though they were not royalty, they actually had dynasties. So children of Sahals became Sahals eventually, uh, although not necessarily from like father to son, the same notion of kind of corporate identity was important there. So the same Sahal family could have multiple siblings, each aspiring for the top job, but not necessarily getting it. Uh, so as a Sahal, you were collecting taxes, participating in rituals. This is interesting. This Sahal actually retired to job of priesthood in his twilight years. Or perhaps was promoted. We don't know which of the two jobs was more prestigious. But first, he went to war, took captives, and then the last scene of in, we know of him shows him dancing a snake dance with the king. So you could change careers. Uh, this uh, fearsome 
provincial governor is, is doing a sacrifice at the, at the end of the period. And of course, presenting captives to the king, that's sort of the primary jobs of Sahals. This Chakmash is actually presenting multiple captives, and that's the lintel from his palace uh, that uh, basically highlights his achievements uh, in, in a campaign against uh, enemies of the royal family. Uh, this is a great story. This is one of those Ahob tunes, uh, personalized incense burners. So it's the it's shape of the head of the ancestor. You burn incense for the ancestor in it, and it was inside a palace. And the palace obviously belonged at some point to this ancestor. And he was from Sikab. It's interesting. So he was not from a Palenque, like Amha. So this is someone from the provinces who rose through the ranks and at some point was appointed the speaker of the king in the civilian matters. So he rose to the very top of the administration. Then he was appointed the military captain and he led the most successful campaign against the enemy of the kingdom that revenged upon the desecration of gods. So the captives they took, those were the fellows who got permanent stone tax in the courtyard of the palace. So this was the person in charge of that campaign. Very successful individual. He witnessed something at 701 and then he passed uh, in 706. And the interesting part here is that at the moment of his death, of course, the king who originally gave him all the appointments, uh, Pakal, he was long dead. His kids were in charge. But as far as the relationships were concerned, this fellow from Ahsikab, he was still the Sahal of the king who appointed him personally loyal. Perhaps it was also symbolic, like he was the Sahal of the great king uh, in life and perhaps in death. He was supposed to continue serving him, uh, you know, in the, in the great beyond. It's like a typical Maya career story, right? Uh, rising through the ranks, becoming one of the top people in the kingdom, yet in a palace not far from the royal one. Uh, the other kind of uh, very important officials are Bandit Bird. We, I say Bandit Bird because we still don't know how to actually decipher the name. It looks like a bird had uh, in a particular kind of crown. And that crown is what we see on the heads of these officials. And it's so ancient that it's never recorded in any other way. These are some of the earliest known members of the court. Uh, this fellow, uh, uh, Ashbalam, literally forest jaguar, he had that job. And he had a little wooden box for his bloodletting instruments. And so we know a little bit about him. We know that he was supposed to be seated into that office, very much like royal office. So it was an actual job. Uh, and and uh, you were doing bloodletting, right? So that was part of uh, the, the role of the bandit uh, bird officials. And there he is with the staff of office and in that special crown. This is the only... Uh, non-royal position that actually has a distinct kind of headdress. Uh, uh, and we know that these people are important because they are the ones who help the king, who can hold the king, touch the king, interact with the king during the most important rituals. So they are sort of personal priests or the high priests. So when the king is crowned as the god, there has to be another god that gives the crown to the king. So it's a very challenging role and that's what this priest does hanabahau uh, helps the king hanabahau in this case represents the celestial king of gods so in terms of the optics of those acts uh, it's a challenging place to be right crowning the king only the most trusted advisors can be allowed with that uh, and the interesting part is that we know that this hanabahau is actually a distant relative of the king so Hanabahau, uh, his maternal grandfather is the same as the paternal grandfather of the king. So presumably, uh, King Hanabakal at some point gave one of his daughters to a non-royal family. And that was the family of those priests. So they are part royalty. Kind of this borderline between the royalty and the non-royalty. And that's why they have this high priest uh, office. And it's very important to remember, there are only this many royal positions out there. These banded bird officials actually have divine prototypes, the gods of twilight, the gods who transport the maze god into the waters of the underworld. They are the banded bird officials. 
So it's kind of interesting too, right? It's like they have a, a role outlined for them in mythology. Um, and, and here we see one banded bird official helping the king, right? He's literally like there assisting the king with the positioning of the divine stuff from, I guess, the king's body parts uh, onto the altar. So they are allowed to help with the bloodlettings. And we see that too as well. Here's the uh, young prince doing his bloodletting for the first time. And there is this priest. He is the one who, who is basically helping the boy. And he is the one holding the bloodletting tool. So once again, like they touch the king, they, they can do things. Uh, they're the only ones who can, presumably. That, and that perhaps explains their importance in this kind of fabric of courtly life. Somewhat similar but less prestigious job is Akhun, literally the keeper or the worshiper. So it's another job that seems to have priestly overtones, but is more like provincial or non royal governor with a wide range of offices and, 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 and jobs. Our best example it comes from the side of Komalkalko. At Komalkalko, it's, it's a rather strange Maya city. They are very much Mayan. Uh, it's the same royal family, uh, or at least part of the history of the site is the same royal family as Palenque, uh, but there's no stone. They're sitting on silt. Uh, there's no stone at all in the city. So it's the only Maya city built out of bricks. So it looks decisively Mesopotamian. So you have like ziggurats built out of bricks, palaces built out of bricks, and then the royals are buried in brick chambers, and the non-royals are buried in jars. Because I guess it's the best thing. If you want, you want to, you know, sit in groundwater and salty soil, then you have to be pickled in a jar. So, so we have these burials uh, in jars, and, and, and they actually have pretty good preservation if the jar is mostly intact. And so there's that jar burial of, of an Akhun, of a priest. And that Akhun was buried with a full record of his ritual achievements, like little shell tabs with dates describing his most important life events. So every time he did something in terms of cutting himself, uh, he would add a little tag to his set, sort of like a little metal so I guess he was fully decorated priest uh, by the time he, he passed away. He also had all the tools of his trade, apart from the perishable ones. So he was buried with a lot of bone needles and steel gray spine for bloodletting, obsidian blades and needles, uh, shark teeth as well, and, and, and little um, figurines, presumably for divination. So you see something like this, you realize you do have a ritual specialist in front of you, and then those tags, they provide additional information. So that's how they look like. That's his portrait, Ahpakaltan. He always looks very serious. But since, you know, these are all mostly dealing with self-cutting, uh, serious matter. Uh, the texts usually describe the act as atoshach, literally to cut oneself in two. And that's a pretty accurate description based on the colonial sources of what actually happens when uh, people cut their, their penises during the blood division rituals. Like the, the skin. And he was doing it once a year on average in this, uh, uh, with the bones, with one, t with one uh, tooth of a shark, with some kind of uh, grass, uh, and with needles. Uh, and those were his mayicht, his gifting, uh, uh, in front of various gods, mostly rain gods of different kinds. And he would do it on spring uh, equinoxes. So spring equinoxes, about a month or so before the beginning of the rainy season, that's when he would do it every year. Uh, so we have this very long record. Uh, that's from a publication by my colleague, uh, Mark Zender. So we see all these uh, references and you can see a lot of them happen around uh, the, the spring equinox. Uh, so on March 23rd, 22nd, 19, 23rd, but once a year, so he had about one year to recover. So this is like a high flagellant position. Yes, uh, but presumably all of them had to do it, except this person actually had a record, uh, like carried on himself. Like, how much did you do for the kingdom? And he was like, like, this is how much I did. Can you, can you match my record? And it's interesting, we have 
other tags in other boroughs they just didn't get preserved you can almost wonder whether anyone had something like this and literally carried it on their bodies at all times sort of like badges of honor uh yes like a general and it's interesting that it mixes his ritual achievements with his military achievements so he had a couple of military like awards so uh it mentions like a uh, capture of Enil Chag, uh, his captive, his 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 captive, right, and 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 the destruction of like some some sites that he commanded. He was Yahauk Ak, military commander, and Ba Ahau, principal administrator of the king. It wasn't just cutting himself, right? He was also managing the civilian affairs, and he led troops in war several times. He was a he fire priest, uh, the servant of the royal fiery crown. So. All of those things are presumably what an Akhun is, right? You serve the gods, you serve the king, you perform specific duties. In addition to, apparently, this person was in charge of bloodletting for the rain gods. A very important job. If rains don't fall, it means he didn't do something right. Uh, so, uh, rain making uh, of sorts. Uh, so, all of these uh, are his uh, lists and, and once again, very specific, right? In terms of what things he did. Oh, he, he does it with a with a flint blade. I don't think it was pleasant, but it was never meant to be pleasant, right? These are people who occupy the top of the society, live an otherwise very lavish lifestyle, but there is a price. You know, every every commoner in the kingdom knows these people are cutting themselves for the common good, for the benefit of all. So the rains would fall. Like, I mean, doesn't that justify all the taxes? Uh, and this, of course, a, a priest from the side of Naranjo. He's just a oh, oh, holy man. So he sits on the bench, probably cuts himself, does all those things, uh, describes the sacrifices of deer, draws pictures of the fire god. Uh, and, and, and that also and, and counts moons, uh, divination cycles, and some periods of time we don't know of. So those are basically Maya, Maya priests. But as you can see from Akhpakatan, they're not just priests. Most of the time, they combine these ritual roles with basically appointments at administration or military appointments. So those sort of go hand in hand. And we have individuals who switch between these appointments too, with, between civilian and the military appointments, for example. That seems to be a pattern. If you already have someone who's trusted, right? Why don't you trust that person with say a military campaign? Because obviously putting someone in charge of a, a group of warriors is a difficult decision for a king, especially if the king cannot be there at the same time, right? So. Uh, so it can only can only be someone who is of utmost trust uh, in, in in his relationships with the king. Uh, further down uh, the social ladder are the Lakam officials, the tax collectors, and also banners, presumably reflecting some kind of military rank, right? So if you're it's it's like you're a district head, and presumably if they need to mobilize warriors, you're the one leading the effort. And if they need to collect taxes, you happen to be the one leading the effort. So in this case, three Lakams are presenting their Patan tribute. And it's not very visible, but there are bundles basically here in front of the king and in front of the king's wife. And the king's wife is the owner of the vessel. Presumably, they celebrate her participation in, in the process. So they're answering to the queen, it seems. Um, so uh, these are Lakams literally banners uh this is a banner from a site of uh yachts and it's interesting because uh he had very fancy things like a, a bowl uh, a drinking cup and a plate unfortunately his grave was looted we still don't know where the site where this was looted from is located we keep searching we know it's in the area where we work uh we found other sites uh, which now belong uh, Balam Hall. We found more recently a site uh, where rulers associated with the Shultun Rol dynasty lived and a couple of looted vessels came from. This is still a mystery, uh, but looters know. So this was a Lakam and, and, and the plate says, Alai Abai Ut Ibnach Ulak. So goes up the painting of the plate of Ta Shen Chan. And the name seems to be abbreviated here because you can see in uh, in here Tashin Chan Hao. Literally, the Lord is in the midst of the sky. Shin means like in the very center, middle. Ta in. 
So Ta Shin uh, Chanahao. So that was his name. Lord is in the middle of the sky, presumably the sun, most likely. And then the text goes, Ba Kelem, literally principal masculine youth or principal male, presumably like head warrior of some sort. So military rank. And then uh, Bakab, so first on earth, it's a ritual function. So this person is, does rituals too. And then the Lakam of Kachyol Kinich, Lord of Yots or Yom, Yom Pitz. Some debate about how to read the name of the kingdom. But So here we have a Lakam who is of a military rank, who holds a ritual job, but ultimately is a tax collector. And, and the other cup, the text basically says uh, the drinking cup for fruity tzihil uh, 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 of Tashin Chanahao Bakab, person from Yotz. So we know he lives in Yotz. So he's, he's in charge of a district of the town. Uh, he distinguished himself in war, holds a ritual position, serves his king. So that's like a, a, a provincial, uh, or I mean, in this case, a town uh, tax collector. So the idea is that the neighborhoods that we see in Maya cities, those are people who may be in charge of those, along with, say, Akhun officials, as, as at Kopan. Uh, this is, of course, the house of uh, uh, one of those tax collectors, Nabnal Kinij, who happens to be the father of the next king. This one is actually nearby, not far from this fellow, uh, within a 30 mile radius, as far as we can tell, even though we haven't located that site, but we know uh, Rio Asul. Uh, so uh, this fellow, Nabnal Knij, the interesting part about him, of course, he has all the things that kings don't have, like you know, bags of black beans. And of course, a lot of objects which are the usual subject of taxes. So a mantles, tribute mantles. So he's got a lot because he is the one, obviously, who collects the taxes and then passes them on. What you also see here is he's talking to Ba'ahal, the principal civil administrator, and, 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 and the reason why this conversation is happening has been debated amongst the specialists because there are these four young men. So people argue that this is a kind of marriage negotiation, even though it's kind of strange why four people are somehow participating in the marriage and why they're talking to a civil administrator. Uh, I'm, I'm not a fan. Uh, there is a caption to the four young looking individuals, but of course, age is problematic in terms of how minds depict nobles in general and people uh, in general so it says uba this is the image of of four and there are four of them then nach tob yichnal usakun four big ones in front of the elder brother so the idea was perhaps they're coming of age and so our protagonist is actually talking to a principal administrator about well jobs right like four brothers is there an opportunity you know, for them, you know, some possibility of the military or civilian position? So we're kind of witnessing how those things were done. Another also potentially interesting opportunity. We know now that the term Sakun may refer to senior position in general, not kinship specifically. And the term Nohtob, like a big one, may also refer to elders or, you know, prominent men in the community. So it's possible that perhaps what we see here are commoners, like prominent commoners. So what we're, what we're looking at is a conversation between Lakam. He is the district head. So he's basically the representative of the crown in this particular area for prominent members of the community. So principal local uh, families, like local commoners, and then a member of the administration. They're probably talking taxes, as would be the matter of concern for everyone. Uh, and, and, and it would make sense that to them, he's like their elder brother. So he's not their lord. He's sort of principal among equals. And that highlights the role of these lakams as sort of in between people, right? Between the commoners and the nobles, right? Between the regime and an average Joe, those would be prominent families, perhaps aspiring to become Lakams one day, right? One of them perhaps could get a chance through trade, through commerce. And it's interesting, they're sitting on the bench, right? There's no hierarchy here. They're all sharing this conversation as equals. 
presumably discussing taxation. So the principal administrator describes, you know, what the crown needs. Uh, the local account says what crown can perhaps uh, get uh, and what crown perhaps cannot get. And uh, the, the, the big people of the neighborhood basically share their own concerns. So perhaps this is the kind of conversation that we see here. So the actual working of my politics uh, at the lowest level between the commoners and the nobles where these boundaries kind of fluid. So this is some kind of local magnate, most likely, and an upstart who, who got his daughter married to, into royalty, or perhaps who got his son uh, uh, married to a royal daughter, one of those options. Uh, and, and, and there he is basically doing uh, low-level negotiations with prominent community members. We know that community councils existed among the Maya. This may be a depiction of one of these conversations. And Lacams act as intermediaries, basically, between the levels of uh, uh, the, government, the government. At the very bottom of Maya political systems, you have these very enigmatic uh, officials called Anabs. We see a lot of Anabs in portly scenes. Those are beautiful Bonapak murals. A lot of people in the scenes are labeled as Anab. And that is applied to, say, musicians. Some of these musicians are Anabs. Some people dancing with the king are Anabs. Some warriors are Anabs. And then a lot of people holding goods, like pelts of jaguars, necklaces, uh, jewelry, are called the nabs. So it's an important position. What is also important, people who hold prominent positions highlight the fact that they are anabs. So this is a provincial governor appointed by the king as Sahal, and he is a, a home, a priest, right? Uh, but he's also a, is anab. It's interesting that he mentions that his father was also anab as something that is worth highlighting, something that is important. And he mentions his Anab credentials and priestly credentials again at the end of the text. So apparently it's a good thing to be Anab. We know that many young people who travel and say leave inscriptions in the great cave of Nachtunich making a pilgrimage are Anabs. So it's kind of educated elite. Um, there are different ways to, to, to translate the term. It may be related to the term on, like existence, essence, but with an instrumental suffix, like the maker. Uh, there's also a term for carving instruments that is also on. And so uh, Steve Houston, my mentor, suggested that anabs can refer to craftspeople, like in a broader term for people who make things. And we know that Maya nobles were engaged in production of beautiful objects. That was actually part of the noble status. So there are things you can buy in the market and there are things you cannot buy anywhere. And we know from the excavations of the rapidly abandoned uh, uh, Maya city of Aguateca that noble families were engaged in craftsmanship of jewelry, uh, beautiful clothing, uh, objects out of jade and ceramics. Those were things which were not meant to be made by commoners. Those were made by the nobles. Perhaps Anab refers to making things. There's also an interesting twist to the term. Uh, so when we see um, signatures of carvers, they are often described as Anabs of their patron. So here's a carver who signed a monument carved at the site of Bonampak, but he is the Anab, Anabil, of the Yashchilan's king. There's another signature of Yashchilan Anab on the lintel of the palace with those beautiful murals. The murals have no signatures of artists uh, who painted them, but the lintels of that building do, and, and those are artists from Yashchilan. And then there is this very curious text on a stalagmite from Yashchilan. So it's a stila. It's actually a whole stalagmite that was yanked out of the cave and carried to the site. And they use the same term, except that it seems to be grammatically different. Instead of saying Yanabil, it's Yanab with a short vowel. 
and it's not the anab of the patron, but the anab of the act. So presumably, like Ahwal is overlord, Ahau is vessel when it's possessed. Something like this is happening here, except Yanabil means someone who is commissioned to do a certain work. Perhaps Anab is someone who commissions. It's not possible to imagine that two individuals mentioned here, fire monkey and white-headed uh, fire god, uh, could have possibly yanked that thing just by themselves and then carry it between the two of them. It's enormous, it's as tall as this room. It's, it's a big stone, it's this wide. Uh, so what we see here is perhaps proud sponsors of the project. That's why we have so many anaps. These are not just people who make things, although perhaps the term implies that too, but people who sponsor things for the court. Sort of like enter into this informal competition between the nobles who want to contribute something, say an aqueduct or a new room of the palace, and then of course leave a plaque saying that it was done in their name. Pretty much building social capital uh, through those acts, through proud sponsorship of certain things. In the same way as today, rich individuals want to commission beautiful buildings on university campuses. I know, for example, uh, for a fact, that it is so much easier to get a sponsor for a whole building, paying tens of millions of dollars, than to get a sponsor for a full professorship. Because, say, I want to spend $20 million on a new building. I'll get a building that have my name on it. I'll be Alex's Hall. And then if I decide to spend the same amount of money on 10 full chaired professorships, there'll be like little plaques in front of someone's door. No one would see those Alex's professorships, right? Uh, who would care about that? Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, the big universities like Notre Dame have a waiting list of people who want to give them money on a building. And no one who wants to give money on uh, their money on, 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 on like endowed professorships. So, so uh, something like this is happening here. So these are people who are presumably engaged in these acts of production and sponsorship. And that's another very important group of constituents of, of a royal court. Because all of those things, they have to be made by someone. The clothing, the buildings, paintings, replastering of, uh, you know, plazas. And some of it may be done by the royal family directly. But a lot of it is presumably anabs, people who sponsor and people who work for them or sometimes it's the same people. So that's another aspect of uh, how Maya societies worked. And so that's all I wanted to, to discuss today. So remember, the king's at the very top. It's a dangerous job being a Maya king. Uh, it comes with risks, mostly in the form of being captured and sacrificed on an altar. Uh, these sacred rulers are usually members of corporate groups. And they serve them as, as collective entities. Uh, Maya society is a society of individuals. So your notion of self is not as based on me as in our Western society. Uh, and then there's a whole range of other jobs and positions below the kings who all aspire to be royalty one day, perhaps, to hold in their families and their courts. And the system generally worked and had an opportunity of promoting people to the top if they were successful, say, economically. And this kind of mobility perhaps assured that the regimes were stable uh, during most of the classic period.